All right, we stopped at the death of Leo, right here. Ooh, he doesn't live anymore. And his son, Constantine the Seventh. Story starts down here in verse 26. Ends up being, you know, the what do you want to call it? He's crowned as emperor, but he's a kid. That always warns you in history and Bible makes a lot of issue about that so he's crowned but he's a kid and what was put up to help him learn how to rule was a seven person regency and the seven person regency of course is just as bad as a one person regency the regents you know exercise the power and they grow to like it okay they grow to like it and so he when he reaches his own age of majority they don't want to let him rule okay so that's the story of this period so what we saw from Basil to Leo was the stars are falling from the heavens as soon as Leo comes up the stars are falling from the heavens that was the attitude of a whole lot of people toward Leo because he was bookish because he wasn't doing too well with his military expeditions he did do some really good reforms and um, he did sort of help out the, the churches and stuff but, you know, he wasn't Basil. And there was always this cloud over him as to who his dad was. So there was, there was a certain amount of, um, what do you want to call it, unrest during his time. At the same time, he did do an awful lot of writing, which was admired. So, the powers of the heavens are shaken when he's dead is true from their perspective both negative and positive negative because they didn't like Leo or positive because they did and now he's dead and the problem is that the kid that he has is like under a cloud also because his kid Constantine the seventh down here his kid Constantine the seventh um, it's like whose kid was he was he I mean how do I want to put this Constantine the seventh was the son of Leo and his mistress he was born in the purple room but was the marriage actually legal and when you when you're living around a bunch of religious people they tend to get superstitious too and it's like oh well if you weren't legally married at the time and in their minds legal meant that it had to be blessed okay and this was the guy who was supposed to bless it but he didn't all right he was he liked the kid but he wouldn't bless the marriage so in a way that makes Constantine an illegitimate kid so he's under a cloud when he starts out too that's the first problem so oh, the heavens are shaken because maybe we don't have a legitimate ruler on the throne now okay and oh, the heavens are shaken because now we got a seven-man regency and they're all jockeying for power with each other okay on top of that and it ends up characterizing his own reign this whole thing it's so hysterical and then they will see the son of man coming in the clouds that's pretty you know second advent language really dramatic sounds like it ought to be a good thing okay but the verse that is being referred to here by the Lord doesn't just say they will see it's going to I forget where it is in the Old Testament but it but it's they will see and mourn I wonder if I can find it 
me see if I can find it. Uh, Alright, good. Let's try to find it. There we go. He's quoting. Let me show you. Right here. Christ is quoting Zechariah 12.10. Oh, bloody hell. Okay, now well, let's see if I can... Ah. Bible Works did not have the best there we go. I can't click on it. You can see it down here at the bottom. Oh, dang. Bottom right corner. Fireworks 5 is much better at this function. See where it says they will look on me whom they have. Look in the lower right hand corner where my cursor is moving around. They, I can't click on it so you're going to have to just look in the lower right hand corner. They will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him. Okay. This is, see, he's coming in the clouds. This is all related. This is all second advent. What people are going to do at the second advent. So that's in Matthew 24, 30, which of course um, Mark is actually tying to. But he's not using the word mourn. He's just saying they'll see him. Okay, because he's expecting you to know that mourn is included in there. Alright, because the Matthew verse, um, I don't remember quite where up sometimes he is. Uh, 2430, I guess. So let's look there. Okay, I've made some big changes to the spreadsheet now. I mean, the works, the writing now as far as organization and stuff like that 2530 oh that'll take me close take me to 26 no it's 2430 that'll still be close enough all right here we go 2430 Coming up, coming up, coming up, coming up. See? Oops, on tie. I haven't tested the seeing verbs yet in Matthew like I'm doing in Mark. They'll see him. This is what's being quoted. Alright. They're going to see him and mourn. Alright. And that the verb for mourn here is really here. All right, they're gonna all the tribes are gonna mourn him when they when they see him in the clouds. That's the actual Matthew verse that Mark is using or tagging to when he writes his own. What happened? Twenty six. Where's twenty six? When he writes his own upsonte here, he's he's tagging Matthew there. See Matthew twenty four thirty. So the the big key point here that's so satirical is that Constantine the seventh they they'd look at him and they didn't like the way he looked. He looked morose. He looked um I don't know, unhappy. Somebody didn't want to be around. So when they looked at Constantine the seventh, when they looked at him, Opsonte, they mourned. Oh, we don't have a good ruler now. Okay, so that's what's so funny about this. See, son is being used, and this is all about a son that was a ruler, um, technically speaking, but he was too young, and then when they looked at him, they mourned. So son of the, the son of the master who died up here. Well, they didn't much like that way. He wasn't as good as Basil in their eyes. And this son? 
Oh man, we look at him and we're gonna mourn, baby. Alright? It's got more meanings than that. That's what this it, the wit of this over the actual history is just killing me when I look at it. Okay. So that's the story of Constantine the Seventh, who ends up dying at nine fifty nine, which is nine fifty one, fifty two, fifty three. 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59. He dies at Ang. Well, you, you really would split it right there. Two G's is pronounced like A-N-G. That's where we get the word angel. Angelus. Okay, it's spelled Agelus, but you say it Angelus. Alright, that's where this boy, Constantine the Fifth, dies. All right, so God has a kind of good opinion of him if he's going to stick him in the middle of Angelus. All right, messenger angel, of course, is what we automatically think of. And so, the characterization of his reign between here and here, which is you know unusually long because he comes to the throne as a kid, is is satirical more about how the people think about him all right but that's not the only layer of meaning here because there's more than one person being referenced but that gives you some flavor of it with respect to Constantine the seventh now in his later reign which ends up coming let's see that's 940 41 42 40 Right here at Dunameos, okay, right at the Os. Um, there was his regents, his regency ends there, but it ends due to a kind of civil war that I'm going to have to talk about because that plays to these words too. Once he gets in power here, really in power himself, alone as emperor, with his wife, he's 39 years old at that time, and his wife really loves him. She's the daughter of the guy who was one of the regents who was basically keeping Constantine Seven under wraps. Okay. So from here to here when he dies, it it's better. I mean a lot better. So there there's certain like coming in power with glory, yeah. He comes into power right here. And largely through the work of his wife, which I'll explain in a few minutes. So it's as if he, you know, he was sent, he sent angels, as if angels were sent for him to help him to get out from underneath the regency that was crippling his ability to rule. Okay? Through his wife. So it's kind of cute about that. But now i got to tell you the rest of the story. Ooh, here, this is when Leo, his dad, dies. When his dad dies, he's too young. So there's another guy, Romanus for the first Lecapenos. All right. And he's kind of like Stilicho. I don't know if you know much about Stilicho or Belisarius and the Roman history of the 400s. But they basically saved Rome. Okay. And that was kind of the problem here, because as soon as, as Leo dies, there's, there's the unrest, that's what, you know, the heavens are shaken. There's unrest in the polity. And there are all kinds of problems that happen. Okay? And because of those problems that happen, in rides our boy Romanos I to save the day. So that's why this is also satirical. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Yeah, clouds always means lots of people, lots of witnesses. And that's basically how Romanus takes power. He was there already. Alright. But he sort of wiggles his way to the top. And by wiggling his way to the top, once he gets in power, he won't let it go. And he has a lot of sons. This is real important. He has a lot of sons and he has one daughter. 
the one daughter he has, just like Stilicho had done, okay, the one daughter he has, he marries off to the emperor. Which immediately, of course, creates all kinds of problems with the other regents. Because, hi, now you're, you're more important than we are. And that created a lot of problems with his sons. Because now whoever is born to the, the couple is going to be next in line. And that rule that keeps the sons out. So the sons don't like it. So by the time we get here, 910, which is 940 A.D. Oh, yeah, he came in the clouds. Uh huh. And by the time he's actually done that, the clouds, including his sons and his daughter, and he's married her off, and given the sons nice positions. I mean, the guy was true nepotism incarnate. I mean, he's got one of his sons is named Theophilactos, and the ki the kid was a, literally a kid, and he replaced. The Patriarch of Constantinople, well, actually, S Stephen died in 928, and that's kind of important because that's the end point here, being stressed. He was replaced, Romanos replaced him with a guy named Trifon. The idea being that, hi, when my son Theophilactos reaches the ripe old age of 16, you have to step down and make him Patriarch of Constantinople at 16. And just to show how important this is, Romanos had his own son castrated. Hopefully you know what that means. Go look it up if you don't. And that would allegedly help his career in the church. Before he's 16, he's castrated. Well, he keeps his voice high. I mean, this is ridiculous. That's what kind of, you know, manipulator Romanus I was. So there was no way he was going to let Constantine VII, the rightful heir, there was no way he was going to let him roll. Okay, but besides the what he did with Theophilactos, all right, he had two or three other sons, I forget if it was two or three. And they're like, you SOB, you married off our sister to the rightful heir, so, you know, the people are going to probably side with them, not us. So we can't succeed you like we want to. And we're really ticked off at you. So from 940 AD for the next four years, meta to Duna me. Okay? Meta duna. Okay, right here. Because it's gonna be a one year interregnum. They they depose him. His own sons depose him. And in order to escape being, you know, blinded, which was the normal stupid Byzantine practice, he decides to become a monk and retire. So he escapes death that way. So Romanus doesn't die, but he is deposed. And then for the next year, the boy's sister, who is the daughter, um, who is the wife now of Constantine the Seventh, manages to expose them and oust them during this May period. So that the Aus, that's when the the sons are deposed also, and. Romanus having retired, not going to try and get out of retirement. Constantine the Seventh is finally in full rule. So isn't that cute? So we got the Absontai, and you don't have the word mourn here, but it was in the Matthew text as you saw. So it's implicit. And that's exactly what people were doing. They were mourning over, oh, we don't really want Constantine the Seventh. Yeah, and that's how Romanus got in. And then he was so power mad and nepotic, you know, putting in all of his kids in power and all of his favorites in power. But they got tired of him too, and his own kids got tired of him more, and they over start to overthrow him starting in 940 AD, and they managed to do it by Meta Duna. And they get their own father deposed. Meanwhile, their own sister married to this guy, 
gets them to pause during the meh. Right here. So now Constantine is alone with his wife. And she's very headstrong like Irene was. And Constantine is 39 at this point And he says, you know what, I really don't have any experience ruling. Why don't you do it, wife? So she did. See? With many power, much power and glory. Yeah, much power and glory now. But it's sort of satirical. You see why? Because he never really is in power. And it isn't really his glory. But it's built out that way. And it's not like he didn't do some good things. They all do some good things. But boy, oh boy. It's, it's like Saturday Night Live here, this kind of language. And then he will send his messengers. Yeah, that's pretty much all he did was send messengers. So he dies as a messenger. And that's what he did do. His whole life he wrote books that were messages. Okay, you see how apt this is? See how satirical this is? So much for Constantine the Seventh. Alright, now, the question is, why is Huion specifically targeting 926 through 28? So, I wrote that up here, and you can read it. Okay, and if you think that there's something more I should have said, because I, I spent a lot of time writing up the significance of this time period. Um, because it's coupled with the E-Day Anaphora. So it really runs from 923 to, to 928. And, you know, because it's Second Advent language, it deserves to be, so, deserves some kind of explanation. And I've just given you one that's not written in here. So if you want to mix that with what's written in here and you agree with it, uh, fine, let me know. If you disagree with it, fine, let me know. Because something about verse 26 is, is center, is central. And I'm going to cover that um, as soon as I figure out what that center is. There's something about this whole period. There's something about this whole period from verse 20 to verse 26 that's being centered on in the meter as definitive for the time. It's like everything that happens here is a product of what went before, of course, but it's like everything that comes after is due to this period. So it's from, you see, because it's sevens. And in particular, at 910, if we just take it from the meter without looking at the years, because it doesn't matter with the years. <coughs> That's 217. That's a pretty significant number in the Bible meter. 217 is the meter that Mary used in her Magnificat, which had a Hanukkah theme of being enslaved and then being set free, because that's what Hanukkah meant. And the 217 that she used is based on Daniel 9, 24 through 26, which of course was about the temple also. But it subtracted the 14 years that Israel was over budget by the time her, t her first temple went down. And Mary's basically accounting for that. How Christ's birth is going to make up for that. Assuming he lives a full 40 years, but he didn't. So this is somehow related to that. As a trend of history, and specifically here as a trend of Byzantine history. Because Byzantine history is still going on. They call it Russia now. But it's still really the same thing. Everybody that's in the lands of the Byzantine, which includes Bulgaria, Hungary, the Lat, you know, the the Balkan countries, um, the underbelly of Russia, you know, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Baluchistan, all those, all those now calling themselves separate. They still have the same mindset, and was as was applicable during this time. It's a lot more sophisticated or slow or less inclined to fight, but still inclined to fight. Just not as bad as before because they're tired now. 
So this is like preview of coming attraction. And since, you know, we got this problem with Putin now, rattling the sabers of empire, which has always been the big draw. The big emotional draw to the Byzantines has always been empire, 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 empire. And that's essentially what Putin is selling to his own people. <coughs> He's going to recreate the Russian Empire. So you see, that's really coming out of this period. I mean, factually I can say it. But I don't know why the Bible is picking these particular years with this particular language. And what are we supposed to discern from it? So I'm going to have to go talk to God about it. So we'll cover and pick up with the next guy after Constantine the Seventh, which is right. When I say he dies, right here. Once I know about that, okay? Peace out. At this point, there's not a whole lot to go on with until we get to verse 29. But basically what happens after Constantine the Seventh dies is his wife takes up with two guys in order to protect her sons who are also young when Constantine uh, the Seventh dies. So she takes up, you know, as lovers, actually marries one of them, um, takes up with two guys in order to keep the empire going and to keep herself protected. And that takes until here. So the oddity is, you know, what's, what, why this text, okay, messengers, messengers has the idea of servants, people who represent you and give out your message. And the text is basically saying that it's really the Lord, but here it's like the ruler sends his messengers and collects all of the elect. And in my earlier videos, I had excluded this out to and included this out to saying that you don't need to say it twice. And that's true, but if you include it, you get a paired clause that makes it poetic. And there are a lot of paired clauses in Mark, just like there are a lot of paired clauses in Matthew. So I now am pretty convinced he's doing that on purpose. By doing it this way, you're stressing that the angels who we consider higher, that we are just as much his as the angels. The original Altos in classical Greek did not, was not a... a we want to call it a possessive pronoun. All right, it was considered an intensive pronoun, which is like if I say I myself went. The myself is an intensive pronoun, has the same kind of function and meaning in um, Greek, except autos means himself. So he himself went, not somebody else. Okay, he himself went to the store. If you wanted to translate himself in the Greek, you'd say autos. All right. So that's the kind of meaning that's being used here. The angels themselves, the angels of his, of himself, not of somebody else. You, you, the elect of himself. It's stressing the possessors the possessiveness. It's stressing, yes, you are his. So in English you might say, and then he sent all, actually two can be a possessive pronoun also, sent the angels, his angels. Even though we already know that they're his, they're str he's stressing they're his. And then that's why this becomes so meaningful. And he got, and they gathered together all the elect, his, stressing your, you belong to him. 
and the 12 of course is the is the meter for Israel and you know Christ is talking to Israel there might not have been a church if they enough of them had accepted them and he would have been his and he would have you know the, the whole timeline was supposed to be he lives to 40 years and and then he still dies on the cross but it would have not have been instigated by the Jews it would have been instigated by the Romans he still would have died and then there would have been all this uproar for 50 years and the Gentiles would have been evangelized through the uproar and the last seven years would have culminated in the temple's destruction sometime by that end of that 50 years and then you know the tribulation would happen anyway this was already scheduled it was just a question of how and so he's stressing that however it happens because it was technically still in doubt whether or not they would believe in him once he died which would only be a couple weeks later um you know you're 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 his of course he's the one who's the owner talking so it comes to have a meaning when you're playing it to the history paradigmally okay because the idea is to know what time it is the history is going to play and this helps you better understand the future because these are like little dress rehearsals for the tribulation to come that's why this language is used so during this time from be between the time Constantine the seventh dies here to 945, 946, this is 976 A.D. here, which is clever, Eck. Um, basically, Constantine's mom bedded and wedded two guys in order to keep her empire together and protect her sons. And that turned out to be a pretty shrewd thing. She turned out to have picked two really good guys. Okay. Never mind how she did it. I mean, you shouldn't. You should mind. The right thing has to be done in the right way. But she picked two guys who are really good at keeping the enemy at bay, both external and internal. So there's a certain amount of prosperity. They're still fighting and stuff, but there's a certain amount of prosperity, victory, and war that occurs during this time. And the guy who, this guy, Romanus, he also had had some victory in war. Okay? There's a guy coming later on who's going to call himself Nikephoros. And that one of them is coming here. I, I, the other Nikephoros, I think he died seven years prior, somewhere around here okay he was gathered home <laughs> all right um but Nikephoros means i mean because of the sound play on false it's easy to think that it means you know being enlightened conqueror the enlightened conqueror light within him blah 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 but there's another verb called pharaoh which means to carry to bear and Nike means to to win to conquer, to beat. So the term can also mean bearer of victory, which is how a lot of people think it's, it means. The thing I know about Greek is that it's always dual entendre, so I'd read it both ways, but you decide. Anyway, the last of them dies here. And that's kind of cute because ek is a birthing preposition and death is birthing you to eternity, so it's not exactly uncomplimentary to either one of them the way this happened but at the same time you know it's it's no it's an outgrowth of the son who was Constantine the seventh so this is kind of funny that Constantine the seventh is being specified here and the guy who usurped the power essentially from him by being regent Romanus won Lecipanos right here. He was he ended up being put down by his sons. All right, so it was all family thing, 
And so if you're not worshiping the real sun or you're not learning the real sun, then you're going to have family squabbles and they won't end well. Yeah, we can all talk about that. Everybody's got family problems. Okay, so I don't have anything much to say about this. You can go read them up. You know, just search here on Constantine. And then in each section in Wiki, they've got a successor link. So click on the successor links and read the story. I mean, I didn't spend a lot of time fact-checking Wiki. A lot of times I find it's wrong. But you can, you can just Google on this. And you can click on the links for their external sources at the bottom. And, you know, see what you think. And if you've got some, you know, stuff that you think that I left out that's too important and shouldn't be left out, let me know. Okay, so I'm signing off for now. My voice is beginning to go.